In the 20th century, the next generation of Rothschilds became obsessed with the idea of returning Jews to their homeland in Israel. James Rothschild's youngest son, Edmund, initiated the process by funding the building of Jewish colonies in what had become known as Palestine. In 1897, the Zionist Congress was formed with the intention of promoting the establishment of a Jewish nation. It intended to meet in Munich, Germany, but when the local Jews heard about it, they protested so much that it had to be moved to Basel in Switzerland. The reason for the protest was that the Jews were quite comfortable in their adopted countries and had no intention of moving back. This led the chairman of the meeting, Theodore Herzl, to state, It is essential that the suffering of Jews become worse. This will assist in the realisation of our plans. I have an excellent idea. I shall induce anti-Semites to liquidate Jewish wealth. The anti-Semites will assist us thereby in that they will strengthen the persecution and oppression of the Jews. The anti-Semites will be our best friends. So there was a conscious decision to have people turn on the Jews to make them uncomfortable in their adopted countries so that they would then have motivation to leave and go back to their homeland. Herzl was thereafter elected as the president of the Zionist organization, which adopted a red hexagram as their emblem. In 1901, the Jewish colonists began to feel like Edmund Rothschild was more of a hindrance than a help. They asked him to take a step back from the process to let them handle their own situation. Rothschild, demonstrating the controlling spirit of Jezebel, angrily retorted, I created the Yushuf, I alone. Therefore, no men, neither colonists or organisations, have the right to interfere in my plans. A couple of years later, in 1903, the Zionist Congress astonishingly appeared to hint at World War I a full 11 years before it actually took place. Max Nordau said at this meeting, Let me tell you the following words as if I were showing you the rungs of a ladder leading upward and upward. Herzl, the Zionist Congress, the English Uganda Proposition, the Future World War, the Peace Conference, where, with the help of England, a free and Jewish Palestine will be created. How did they know about a future world war ahead of time? Well, interestingly, Albert Pike had talked about three future world wars way back in 1871. He wrote a letter to Giuseppe Mazzini, dated 15th of August, whereby he claimed he had received a vision. In that vision, he had been told of three world wars that were to come. Each of them would work on the Hegelian principle, where they would clash two opposing ideologies together to create a specific outcome that would further the plans for a new world order. It should, however, be noted that the existence of this letter is now denied, and there is no hard and fast evidence that it actually exists. Jacob Schiff, meanwhile, was working away at regaining control of America's finances. In 1907, he made a speech to the New York Chamber of Commerce, warning those present that, Unless we have a central bank with adequate control of credit resources, this country is going to undergo the most severe and far-reaching money panic in its history. It may have been more of a threat than a warning. In 1913, the Rothschilds finally managed to get their way and established a third central bank of America, which was called the Federal Reserve. That's the Central American Bank that still exists today. Shortly before the Act was passed, Congressman Charles Lindbergh stated that The Act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the President signs this bill, the invisible government of the monetary power will be legalized. The greatest crime of the ages is perpetrated by this banking and currency bill. The President at the time, Woodrow Wilson, later acknowledged his terrible mistake, saying, I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. We have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. No longer a government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. The Federal Reserve is today conservatively estimated to make $150 billion a year, but it has never had to publish any accounts, true to the wishes of Meyer Rothschild. 
1914, with the American bank situation taken care of, the First World War happened 11 years after Max Nordau talked about it and 43 years after Albert Pike had seen it in his vision. On November 2, 1917, British Foreign Secretary and occultist Arthur Balfour issued the statement known as the Balfour Declaration. The declaration was addressed to Lord Rothschild, meaning the eldest son of Nathan Rothschild, Walter. It stated that Britain was in favour of establishing a Jewish settlement in Palestine. And so it was. After World War I came a peace conference held at Versailles and hosted by Edmund Rothschild. The issue of Palestine was raised at this conference and Britain handed the land over to the Rothschilds. As well as gaining a Jewish state from the war, the League of Nations was an attempt to bond nations together en route to a one-world system. It was ineffective, however, as not enough countries accepted it at that time. And so, on to the Second World War. Pike's vision stated that the outcome of this war would be to create tension between atheistic communism and Christian capitalism. Pike felt that communism would be strong enough to balance Christendom, which would be then restrained and held in check until the time we would need it for the final social cataclysm. This capitalism v. communism, thesis v. antithesis, indeed established itself over the next 46 years. G.K. Chesterton saw what was happening. At times, capitalism and communism would appear to be in conflict, but this writer is confident that their interests are in common and will eventually merge for one world control. That policy outlined in Woodrow Wilson's Point Six has never been dropped. Capitalism and communism are merely their twin mechanisms to destroy the sovereignty of Christian nations. They will merge them into the projected superstate. They are selling us into slavery and using our material resources for their own nefarious worldwide purposes. We keep seeing the same two-pronged attack idea repeated over and over, where both prongs appear to be opposing each other, but are actually just designed to bring about a third way, which is what the occultists wanted all along. Remember how occultists talk about the male and female creating a third spiritual energy, illustrated by the square and compass creating the G in the middle in Freemasonry. It's that same idea. Two opposing things coming together to create a third way. As George Hegel put it, thesis v. antithesis equals synthesis. Whether it be light v. dark, or male v. female, Baal v. Asherah, or masonry v. Catholicism, or Republican v. Democrat, or in this case capitalism v. communism, it's the synthesis they really want. That's what they're really after. Google the phrase third way with regard to politics, and you'll see how many modern politicians are disciples of this way of thinking. Vladimir Lenin, the communist leader, highlighted the fact that the war between capitalism and communism was just part of something much bigger when he said, I don't care what becomes of Russia. To hell with it. All this is only the road to a world revolution. Incidentally, the Third World War in Albert Pike's vision was said to happen between the Jews and the Muslims. Pike believed that supporters on both sides, already tiring of war from previous conflicts, would fight themselves into a state of mental, physical, spiritual and, very importantly, economic exhaustion. The world would then be ready for the coming Antichrist to save them from it all. Albert Pike said of that time that, We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a great social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to all nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origins of savagery and of most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere, the people will be forced to defend themselves against the world minority of the world revolutionaries, and will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitudes, disillusioned with Christianity, whose spirits will be from that moment without direction and leadership, and anxious for an ideal, but without knowledge where to send its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out into public view." a manifestation which will result from a general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of atheism and Christianity, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Notice what he's saying here, that they would conquer and exterminate both Christianity and atheism at the same time. You see, the Enlightenment era that we've been studying in this third section gave birth to atheism, which is one of the hallmarks of the modern era. It was basically people trying to escape from God. 
But that period, defined by an increase in atheism, was only meant to be a temporary phase in the long-term plan, according to Pike. After the modern era, the world would then enter into what we now call the postmodern era, which is where we currently are today, a time in which people would move away from outright atheism towards strange religion, mystery religion. This represents the time when the mysteries would start to externalise themselves. They would gradually move out from the shadows and into the open. Mankind would come to be fed up with both Christianity and atheism and would return to the synthesised mystery religion. In this condition, they would be ready to finally accept the manifestation of Lucifer, the Antichrist. We are already seeing this happening. Far fewer people than we realise are now outright atheists. Atheism is too cold, it's too heartless for the average person. People want to believe they'll see their friends and family again after death. And God has written eternity into our hearts, so it's a natural craving. Many have already moved towards a form of spirituality based on the occult but which they think is wholesome and true. They often talk about being a spiritual person, but not subscribing to any specific religion. And the Bible tells us that this would happen. Paul wrote to Timothy about the last days in his second letter saying that people would act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. He also says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Just to tie off one loose end before we finish this part. In 1930, the Rothschilds established the First World Bank in Switzerland. Just four years later, banking secrecy laws were changed in Switzerland, making it an offence punishable by imprisonment for any bank employee to violate bank secrecy. This ensured that bank secrets were kept that way, and no one really knows what goes on inside. This bank was the forerunner to the present-day IMF and the World Bank.